ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحج حج محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار This speech or this address of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in abridged form is called khutbah al-hajj and it is something that he would repeat many many jumuas and in marriage ceremonies and before many of his lessons and it's something that we hear over and over yet we may not contemplate but in the end of it he said fa inna astaqa al hadith kitab allah and the most truthful speech is the book of allah wa khayr al hadi hadi muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the most truthful are in the best guidance and the best guidance is the guidance of muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharr al umur muhtathatuha and the most evil of affairs are the newly invented matters in the religion wa kullu muhtathatin bid'ah and every newly invented matter in the religion is an innovation wa kullu bid'atin dalala and every newly invented or every innovation every newly invented matter in the religion is an innovation and it is misguidance wa kullu dalalatin fil nar and every misguidance is in the hell fire in this short segment of this address from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam there are many benefits one of them that we learn is that intention is not enough having the good intention is not enough that everything must be in accordance with the book of allah and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam so we we deduce from this as that what you might see in the masajid or what you might learn or see from the muslims is not necessarily islam There is a narration from Imam Ad-Darimi rahimahullah which brings this matter in clarity for us. He said that Abu Musa Al-Ash'ari radiyallahu anhu he went to the masjid one morning and when he went into the masjid he saw something that he disliked. Remember this story is in the time of the Sahaba the qarn al mufaddal the blessed and the preferred generation so if this narration could happen early to them then more so it can happen to us so abu musa al ashari radiyallahu anhu he saw something and he left out to go to the house of abu abdul rahman abdullah ibn mas'ud and he saw others waiting out and he asked Has Abdullah bin Mas'ud left yet? They said no, we're waiting for him. So he waited with them. When Abdullah bin Mas'ud came out from his house, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari said, "I came from the masjid and I saw something which I did not like." He said, "What did you see?" Abu Musa he said, "If you live, you will see it." But I saw people in the masjid waiting for salah. and they were sitting in circles 
and every circle had a leader amongst them with some stones. And the leader amongst them would say, say Allahu Akbar 100 times. And they would move these stones from one side to the other counting, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And when he finished, he would say, say La ilaha illallah 100 times. And they would move the rocks 100 times. And he would finish, they would say, say Subhanallah 100 times. Abdullah ibn Mas'udi asked Abu Musa al-Ashari, what did you say to them? He said, I didn't say anything. Rather, I waited for your opinion. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, we went to the masjid. And he saw what Abu Musa al-Ashari radiallahu anhu saw. He said to them, what are you doing? They said, we are counting our takbirs and our tahleels and our tasbihs. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu, radiallahu anhu, he said, count your sins, for indeed your good deeds will not be lost. Woe to you, O, o followers of Muhammad, how quick are you to be destroyed. The companions of your prophet are still alive amongst you. His clothes have still not been worn out, and his vessels have not been broken. Either what you are doing is a religion which is better than the religion of the Prophet ﷺ, or you have opened a door to deviation. I heard, this is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud saying, I heard the Prophet ﷺ saying that there will come a people who their recitation of the Quran will not go past their cervical bone, their, their collarbone here. Meaning the Quran will not enter into their hearts. It will be said something on their tongues. They will have the makharaj of haruf in their throats and on their tongues, but it will not reach their hearts. He said, and I fear that most of you are from amongst them. Amr ibn Salama, rahimahullah, the narrator of this story, he said, and I saw most of those people fighting with the Khawarij on the day of Nahrawan against Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu, and the rest of the Sahaba. This tremendous narration, Ya Akhwan, it tells us that not everything you see the Muslims doing, not everything you see in the masjid is a dalil or an evidence that it is correct. Let us put ayat around the top of the masjid. No, the Quran is not meant for decoration. But they do it in Mecca. They do it in Medina. What they do in Mecca, in the masjid today, what they do in Medina, in the masjid today, is not a delil, ya ikhwan wa akhawat. What is done in the Quran, what is told by us in the Quran and the Sunnah, the way that the Salaf understood it, then this is an evidence for us. This thing that might be different from the way of the Quran and the Sunnah, according to the understanding of the Salaf, could be the Salat. We could be doing something in our Salat that is not in accordance. It could be our wudu. It could be our dhikr. It could be our, our aqidah, our belief system. It could be in our way of making dua. The only way for us to know for sure if what we're doing, what we're saying, what we're believing, how we're interacting with each other, how I'm dealing with my Lord, how I'm dealing with my family, how I'm dealing with the masjid, how the masjid deals with me. The only way we can know for sure or not is to refer back to the book of Allah and the sunnah of his prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the way that the salaf understood it and not just look at what the muslims in such and such place are doing or what such and such masjid has or does Alhamdulillahi wahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'du. Amma ba'du, 
Islam, ya ikhwan wa akhwat, is based on the Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the Sahaba and those first three righteous generations. Up until the Day of Judgment, this is what Islam is going to be. When we narrate this hadith and those like it, we do not narrate them in order to refute or to pick on others. But we narrate these hadith so that we can remind ourselves to look at our own relationship with our Lord. Our own dealings with others. Not so that we can say so and so is off of it, so and so is off of it. But rather so that we can make sure that we are on it. That we are following the path that Allah has ordered us to follow. Is my salat correct? Or am I praying the way I was told? Without ever looking at the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, which detailed described our prayer. Is my wudu correct? Or am I just making wudu the way the guy showed me when I became a Muslim? Or the way I see the people in the wudu station making wudu? Is the way I make dua? Is the way, is the dua that I make is the dhikr that I make, is my belief system correct? Or am I just saying and parroting back everything that I heard the other Muslims doing and saying elsewhere? If I have a task, if the Imam tells me to do something, am I going to carry that task out in the way that the Quran and the Sunnah have described? Or am I going to do it the way I feel it should be done because my intentions are good? The likes of this hadith, ya akhwan, are for us. They're for making us think about our relationships. They're also making us think before we teach or advise one another. Maybe a person is content making wudu the way he was shown, the way he sees other Muslims making wudu. But does that mean he should teach the wudu that he saw others make to someone else and then tell them this is the Islamic wudu? Maybe he's content praying the way he was brought up praying without ever evaluating that according to the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. But should that person go around teaching others this salat that he just has been blindly following all these years without, not, without knowing if it's correct or not. And then tell that person, that new shahada, that this is the salat of Islam. When I advise the imam or the administration of a masjid, Am I advising them with the Quran and the Sunnah or am I advising them with what I see in all the other masajid? Almost every masjid has ayat. Almost every masjid has Allah and Muhammad. Almost every masjid has this and that. Using them as an evidence when they are not an evidence, Ya Akhwan. It is upon us to advise ourselves with the Quran and the Sunnah. First and foremost, to advise our families with the Quran and the Sunnah. And to advise those in authority with the Quran and the Sunnah. Our numbers do not matter. How many masajid do it? How many Muslims do it? Does not matter. Otherwise, the day that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu stood up against the apostates, it would have never have happened. And Islam would have failed. Because every single person that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq consulted was against fighting them. While he took it upon himself and said, No, if they refuse for me anything that they gave the Prophet وسلم, I'm going to fight them, even if it's a whip. And he was right and they were wrong. He was the minority and they were the majority. How old you are does not matter. Otherwise, Usam ibn Uzayd radiallahu anhuma would have never been appointed as the leader of the army. And Abdullah ibn Masood would have never sat in the circles of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. 
What matters, ya akhwan, is the Qur'an and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the Sahaba. كَمْ مِنْ مُرِيدٍ لِلْخَيْرِ لَنْ يُصِيبَهُ This is the statement that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said to these people in the masjid, how many people want good, but they don't achieve it? The only way to success is the ayat that we quoted in the beginning of the ayat, وَمَنْ يُطْعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزٍ عَظِيمًا Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, then they are the ones who will achieve the great success. Aqeem Salah.